Shelter. 
So appreciative of the opportunity and privilege we've had to be here these days. As usual, we enjoy the fellowship. I enjoy our time together. Amen. And uh, we'll be praying for the church and for you as, Amen. as we part until we meet again. As the pastor said, if we meet again on this side, we'll keep in our prayers. And we ask you to do the same for us. Amen. Amen. We'll pray for us. And we'll be very grateful. Appreciate all the hard work that you did. Thank you, uh, Pastor's wife, Miss Mabel, for her good cooking. And for those that fixed meal yesterday and for the nice place to stay and all the things that made my time here pleasant. Amen. I like to have pleasant times. And uh, if you can't be home, it's good to feel like you are at home as best yeah. you can. And uh, I appreciate your hospitality. Genesis chapter 50, going to the last few verses there, actually kind of the last few verses. We'll begin reading in verse 14, and uh, we'll read down through uh, verse 19. Genesis chapter 50, verse 14, this is the last days of Jacob has passed away, and Joseph and his brothers would go and bury Jacob. He asked them not to leave him there, but bury him uh, in the promised uh, land, if you will, where his uh, wife and parents were buried. And so they returned, in verse 14, into Egypt. He, Joseph, of course, and his brethren, and all that went up with him to bury his father after he had buried his father. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will pre-adventure hate us and will certainly requite us of all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brother and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, Forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not. 
I question, or am I in the place of God? Amen. Joseph is given more chapters in the book of Genesis than any other individual in that book. Joseph is a great, what we call, type of Jesus Christ. Right. There are several chapters in a book. Uh, Brother uh, Larry and myself are talking about the author of the night. And in his book, on the book of Genesis, he has, I believe, a hundred or plus types of Joseph in relation to Christ. You can talk about those relations for a long time, Joseph being a type. Joseph's life, practically speaking, was a roller coaster, wasn't it? It was an up and down, a sunshine, a storm cloud. It was a smile and a tear. About the time he thought, I say he, by the time it looked like he was achieving great things, then Joseph began to, as we would judge it, lose. And Joseph thought he was doing well, then not very long later, it seemed like Joseph was, was failing. He's losing. All of that being said, he comes to the end of his life and his brothers. He had 11 brothers. Ten of them were just old conniving, you know, not really good people. And they send a messenger and eventually come to Joseph. And they said, Joseph, we forgot to tell you what Dad said when you stepped out of the room. We hate you missed it. He said, forgive us for what we did to you. Now, there's no record of Jacob ever saying that. But these brothers, they, they're, they're liars. They are uh, they're connivers. And they felt remorse, I'm sure, and guilt. But they also felt fear. Right. And they wanted Joseph. And they knew that Joseph and Jacob were real close. You remember Jacob made Joseph his coat of many colors and remember that Jacob loved Joseph more than all the other brothers and they knew that Joseph would would, would do whatever Jacob said even if he didn't even hear it he just heard that he said it and Joseph looks at them and makes that statement am I in the place of God Amen. now like as I told you earlier this week like the old preacher said Name but one God and you ain't him. Right. And the truth of the matter is if there's anybody that could have desired or wanted to be God, I'd say it been Joseph. Mm -hmm. For various reasons. To get him out of all the messes he was in. To judge all the people that had done him wrong. To tell the truth when no one else believed him. There's a lot of areas in the life of Joseph that I could definitely say he wished he was God. But Joseph knew he wasn't God. And he wasn't asking that question as if to say, I am way up here in Egypt, and I am just as high as God is. He wasn't saying that at all. But he was saying, listen, he, 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 he emphasized that in the next verse, that very familiar verse, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. That's a, just a double emphasis on that question. Am I in the place of God? But as we look at Joseph's life, seeing that question, am I in the place of God? You find that Joseph demonstrated three character traits that were godly. And I want to, I want to highlight those tonight that you and I can do as well. Notice number one, in the life of Joseph, First of all, Joseph never did demand to understand from God. True. Joseph never demanded to understand what God was doing. Now I give you three breakdowns we find that, that, that demonstrated in his life. Number one, Joseph never did de demand to understand from God in regards to the dreams that he had. You remember, that's the big thing about Joseph was his dreams. Right. Joseph dreamed one day that the these 11 sheaves 
out in the field, they all did obeisance, reverence to Joseph. Joseph dreamed at the stars, and they, they all did obeisance to Joseph. And in other words, they were he was going to be somehow or another uh, was going to be in a great place of authority. He told those dreams to his brothers. Now, in those days, there was no written word of God. Maybe it's not even the first book of the Bible completed. There was no written word. And God spoke to men in dreams and visions. Now, he doesn't do that today. That's right. There's no new revelation. That's right. There's people go around and they peddle this, the new revelation. They got all they got a new revelation from God. Well, uh, I'm not going to mock them by saying they ate too much pizza or anything like right. that. But I'll tell you this, there is no new revelation from right. God. Right. I'm not saying you won't have a dream. I'm not saying anything about that. But I'm saying there will be no more added to the 66 books we have Amen. in the Word of God. Now, he may, he may reveal something to you out of these book pages that you've never seen before. But he's not going to add to this. Right. It's, it's the, we call it the canon of the Scripture. It's all complete. He doesn't get any new word. But in that day, the Lord did speak to men through dreams. And that's what he was doing to Joseph, with Joseph. He was giving Joseph a dream, and those dreams were to be told. And Joseph went and told those dreams. But never did he ever find Joseph ever saying, God, why do I have to be the one to, to tell this? Why do I have to be the one to, to uh, uh, talk about being elevated and being respected and being honored? Uh, Lord, don't you see Judah over there? He's... He, he's a pretty good fellow. Uh, don't you see Reuben? He's the oldest. And how about Levi? Why not give it to him? Why do I have to be the one to bear this type of news? Can we can we change the dream? Can we make it a little bit more user friendly? Can we make it more socially accepted? Can we make it uh, more easily to be understood? He never did demand to understand from God in regards to the dreams that he had. Amen. He just carried the message that God had given him. Right. Now in the world, I don't want to get sidetracked in religion today. People like to change the message. That's right. They like to water it down to make it more socially accepted. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, one of the major voices in this what we call mega church movement years and years ago when it began uh, its grassroots, the way that individual uh, built his evangelistical method was by going in the community and asking just average uh, people in the community what they liked in the church. And he took the top ten things that people liked in the church, not not other churches, but just local people. Some saved, some lost. He didn't know. He was just getting a, doing a survey and he took the top ten things that were mentioned the most and that's what he implemented in his church. And that church right. obviously grew. Grew by leaps and bounds. Can I tell you, that's not how God builds his church. That's right. He doesn't build his church by whatever everybody <laughs> likes. He builds it based on the word of God. He yeah. says that in 2 Corinthians, doesn't he? Uh, no other foundation can any man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. <laughs> so we see Joseph never did demand to understand in regards to the dreams. Secondly, Joseph never did demand to understand in regards to the division in his home. There's one thing you notice about Jacob's home. It was heavily divided. Yep. Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children. And he made him a coat of many colors. Jacob should have known better than that. Because it was that favoritism that caused havoc in his own home as a child. Right. Rebecca loved Jacob. And uh, Isaac favored Esau. And that's what caused all of that dis. Discontentment, that that uh, discord in that home, and lo and behold, if he doesn't do the same thing in his own home, and there's division in this home, the book says that Jacob's Joseph's brother hated him, and the more that Daddy showed him favoritism, the more they hated him. When he had these dreams, the more they hated him. They hated him yet the more, the Word of God says. But he never do. You never find Joseph ever coming to God and saying, God, why do I have to have a home like this? Why can't my home be like a home down the road? Why, why can't why can't we get along like everybody else gets along? Why can't why can't my brothers love me like my neighbors' brothers and sisters love him? Why do I have to have a home that's divided and there's so much contention? Why do I have to have? Well, I didn't ask for this. I was born into it. Well, this isn't fair. Why does it have to be like this? 
Joseph never did demand to understand from God in regards to the vision, in regards to the dreams, and in regards to the dungeon. You remember when Joseph went to Potiphar's house, and we'll talk more about that in a moment, when Joseph went to Potiphar's house, and after a while, Joseph was cast in the prison, not for anything he'd done wrong, but simply for doing right. Joseph came to his brother, and they saw him, and he threw him in a pit, not because of anything he'd done wrong, but because he was doing what his father told him to do. Right. Joseph never demanded to understand from God about the dungeon, the division, the dreams. Matter of fact, in every aspect of Joseph's life, there's so many positives, but there's also a lot of negatives. Nowhere does he ever demand that God give him a reason why. I'll tell you tonight, uh, uh, I, I have a hard time sometimes at things in, in, in life. That's right. Sometimes things in life I look at and I'm wondering, I'm perplexed, but I'm going to tell you tonight, uh, listen, uh, God does not have to give us a reason why. Very right. You remember this little statement. It's not wrong to ask God a question, but it is wrong to question God. Right. There's nothing wrong with asking God a question, but it is wrong with questioning God. If we ask God a question, we're asking God a question so he'll inform us. So, so we'll take what he tells us and do what we need to do. Whether we're in the wrong and we say, God, why is this happening? Whether it's something in the home or in the health or whatever it might be. I hate to even hesitate to even give an example lest I uh, make it seem applicable in your particular situation. And I'm not intending to do that. More I'm intending to just highlight the fact that uh, when things happen in our life, there's nothing wrong with seeking God's wisdom and guidance if it's something that He's sending our way, whether it's uh, a punishment or whether it's uh, something to get us to have more faith in Him or anything like that. There's nothing wrong with asking God a question. Lord, is it something you're showing me? Is there something that you want me to do? But it is entirely different when we begin to question God. As if God, you're not fair. As if God, you're not doing right. As if God is unjust. To question God is to slide his wisdom. To question God is to, uh, to disagree with his love. To question God is to throw a mud upon God who he is and what he does. Right. It's not wrong to ask God a question. It is wrong to question God. After all, Corinthians says we are his, his property. In 1 Corinthians 6 we're bought with a price. Therefore, we're not our own. He never did demand to understand. I've used the example so often about children. If you take uh, these little children, and it's nice to have little children all over the church. Isn't it? Amen. You take the children, you know, maybe a little older than Mercy, a little bit more in the toddler age where, where they can talk back and forth and communicate to a three-year-old and you begin to explain to them things about life you you tell them about you know uh finances you sit them down and you tell them why we why we can't buy ice cream all the time why we why we you know we can't eat candy for supper and breakfast and lunch and why you have to turn the lights off when you walk out the room i mean can't get teenagers to do that but you know you tell them about why you can't just waste your money? You've got bills to pay. You give them just the basics of finance. Well, you know they can't understand that. They don't have the maturity level. They don't have life experience. They're not less of a person, but they, they're not to that level. Right. Now, just as we know they can't understand that, how much more can we come to God who made all the heavens and earth with just his voice. Right. Who by his command caused the sun to rise this morning. And by his command and his command only will the sun set tonight. Yeah. Right. Who God in his wisdom keeps the tide from 
going out when it's supposed to come in and vice versa. God who knows all the stars by name. God who knows every hair on your head. How can we ever think we can understand what he's doing? I don't want to get bogged down and I don't want to be mean, but you know, oftentimes we live in a little bubble. We think we're the we're the center of the universe. Everything revolves about our comfort. That's right. Yeah. I mean, listen, Lord, don't you know who I am? Have you not seen who you're dealing with here? And we make this statement. I've made it oftentimes. We say, why does good things happen to bad people? The question we should ask is why do bad things uh, why do bad things happen to good people? The question we should ask is why do good things happen to bad people? Right. And we make this statement, why me? Have you ever turned that around and said, Why not you? What makes me any better? What, what why why is my children any better to not have problems than the, than the neighbors? Why am I any better than the fellow down there? Why should I not have this situation? I'm saying Joseph never did to man to understand from God. That's a big deal, isn't it? Amen. Secondly, Joseph never did bow to bitterness. Joseph never bowed to bitterness. Let me give you three, three examples of that. Number one, Joseph never bowed to bitterness towards his brethren that forsook him. Right. His brethren that forsook him. Now nowhere in the life of Joseph does he ever do anything bad to his brothers. He never treats them ill. He never does. Matter of fact, Jacob said to Joseph, go find your brethren. They're over there in Shechem. And he goes to Shechem. They're not there. He goes, a man sees him wandering in the field. He says, uh, who are you looking for? He says, I seek my brethren. There, I thought I'd seen him over in Dothan. So he heads out. And his, these, these are not equals. These are grown men. Joseph 17. Joseph is the last of 10. And he's 17. So these men are 50, 60 year old. These are grown, robust men. And they see this little teenage boy coming. And they hate him. And they begin to plot as they see him coming. They're out in the field. You can see him coming for hundreds and hundreds of yards away I would imagine. Yonder comes that dreamer and they say let's kill him. Let's get him. And Reuben to his credit he said let's not kill him because he was going to come back and get him wasn't he? Let's throw him in this let's throw him in this empty well. And here comes Joseph. I don't know if he's if he was from Georgia he'd be whistling Dixie. <laughs> and here he comes in the field not thinking nothing about it and these grown men grab him, nine of them. He ain't got a he ain't got a chance, does he? And they rip his coat off of him. And while one's ripping uh, ripping his coat into pieces, and six or seven of them holding him down, the other ones they're over there killing one of the sheep and getting his blood. I mean, this is this is rough stuff. Sprinkling this blood on this coat, the other ones are throwing Joseph down in the pit, and the word of God says that they sat down and ate. And while they sat down and ate, Joseph is screaming for help. You look in chapter 42 and verse 21. Later on, you'll find that to be what happened. They're pleading for Joe. Joseph's pleading for them to help. I don't know what he said, but he, I would guess he'd say, please don't do this. What are y'all going to do to me? What have I done to you? I don't understand what's going on. He's pleading with them. And then you know the story. The Egyptians pass by. The, the, the Ishmaelites come. They draw him out. And they sell him as a slave. The last time they saw Joseph, he was shackled, I would imagine, hand uh, and, uh, and foot to the man in front of him, going off yonder. They don't know where he's going. They don't know what's going to happen to him. They're just over there counting their loot. Right. Splitting the 30 pieces or 20 pieces of silver amongst themselves. And I can hear Joseph hollering, please don't do this. Please don't do this. Crying out for help. And they could care less. And you know what's even worse? They never do care. Mm -mm. Right. They never do care. 
They only start caring when Joseph starts tightening the screws when they come to get that coin in Egypt. Adam man asked me a while back about that. He said, why did Joseph do that? I, I think one of the reasons was to bring conviction to them for what they had done. But you know what, Joseph, he didn't spend those 13 years in Egypt saying, well, I can't wait to see them again. If I ever see them again, i tell you what I'm going to do with them. Them sorry, no good brothers. He never sends any soldiers down from Egypt to Canaan to find them and get retribution. Right. Brothers that forsook him could care less about him. He never bowed to bitterness towards the boss that forged a lie against him. Old Potiphar's wife tried to get Joseph and seduce him, but he never did bow to her, her enticement. And Joseph's uh, boss, uh, Potiphar's wife, she lied on Joseph and had Joseph put in prison for something he did not do. Even worse than that, something he didn't want to do. Something he didn't even think about doing. Something he never even considered doing. Had him put in prison. Joseph's in prison for several years. He's not in prison hating this woman for lying on him. And then when he gets out, he's over Potiphar. Nobody's over Joseph but Pharaoh. You know what Joseph didn't do? When Pharaoh gave him his ring and put a robe on him, sat beside him, he didn't say, no, Pharaoh, I'll, I'll go ahead and we'll divide the corn and I'll do all that stuff about the food after Potiphar and his wife and all those people in that house come and stand before me and apologize. I want my name vindicated. Don't you know what they're saying about me on Facebook? Don't you know all the videos they put on me on YouTube? I want them to retract it. They're going to have to eat crow. He never one time tells Pharaoh to make them tell the truth. Right. Because he wasn't bitter. He never got bitter towards the butler that forgot him. The butler. Baker and Butler in jail. Joseph tells the dream. The Baker's executed. And the Butler's set free. And all Joseph asks is, remember me. I'm not, I don't deserve to be down here. They take me from my homeland and they falsely imprison me. Just remember me. How could somebody forget somebody like that? I never could understand how a man is so sad and this fellow comes walking up and tells him the interpretation of his dream and lo and behold, three days, not three months, but three days later, he's free just like the man said he was. You would have thought, I'd be thought that guy was right. I can't believe it. But he forgot him. And he didn't forget him for one day, six months, but he forgot him for several years, two whole years. The book says two full years. My. Forgot him. Joseph didn't get out of prison saying that sorry rock no but where is he at? Put him back in prison. I, I suffered for two full years because of, of your so-called amnesia. <laughs> he never got he never got bitter. He never got bitter. I'm talking about somebody that mistreated him. I'm talking about somebody that, that lied on him. I'm talking about somebody that didn't didn't uh, 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 have reciprocal kindness. Didn't get bitter. I, I believe everybody in this room has fallen under some of that. You've had people lie on you or you've had people not been kind back to you. You've had people forget the kindness that you had. And I'll tell you that old bitterness, it's in every about every church. I'm sad to say it's in so many different lives. People have done you wrong, whether it's in your childhood or whether it's on the job or whether it's in a marriage. Bitterness works in. Nothing ever good comes out of bitterness. Never, never, never. Hey, a bitter person is never a happy person. He never bowed to bitterness. Right. Joseph never demanded to understand. And Joseph never lost sight of the Lord. Amen. Joseph never lost sight of the Lord when he went through the trials. 
Joseph was a slave. Joseph was hated by his brethren. Joseph was put in the pit. Joseph was lying on. Joseph was put in prison. But every one of those places you find Joseph, he always was looking to God. Even in the hardships of life, he never lost sight of the Lord. When the troubles came, the trials came, the hardships came, the heartaches came, the 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 uh, the distance from his family came. The, I'm sure he was heartbroken. Listen, his youth was stolen from him. His his relationship with his father was severed because of these evil brethren. His his comfort in Potiphar's house was uh, was uh, eliminated because of a lying woman. But all of those things, he 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 never lost sight of the Lord. He knew the Lord somehow or another had his way in the world with him. He knew the Lord somehow had his way in the storm. And he, he just never lost sight of the Lord. I tell you, it's kind of like those disciples when they were rowing in that boat. You remember that? How they were rowing in that boat and, and the waves were passing. And the Lord came walking and the book says he saw them toiling in rowing. They couldn't see him, but he could see them. And Joseph knew, though he was in Egypt, though he's been lied on, though he's been for God, though he's been forsaken, God was still watching him. That's right. And I tell you tonight, the Lord's still watching you. That's right. Yeah. He never lost sight of the Lord in his days of trial. He never lost sight of the Lord in his days of temptation. But Potiphar's wife. Joseph comes up, I would imagine, being a strong, young, 17-year-old boy, had that sun tan skin from working out at the cattle, had biceps, and triceps, and all the other exceptions. And old Potiphar's wife thought, I'll get this one. Fresh meat, young, innocent, Naive. That old cowboy never seen nothing like down here in Egypt. I'll get it. So she just began to drop little seductive, sensual hints. And Joseph didn't take the bait. And she dropped more. The book says she enticed him every day. And he never did yield. Finally, she got him alone. Surely she can get him now. And Joseph says, oh no. He said this. This was his foundation of his refusal. How can I sin against God? How can I do this thing against God? Right. What about that? Oh, part of his wife could have said, oh, Joseph, you're in Egypt, buddy. Don't worry about that old God in Israel. He can't see you way down here. You're not in God's land. You're in Egypt. We we have we just have a good time down here in Egypt. I won't say a thing about that, and I won't tell God about that. We'll keep it a secret. <laughs> and old Joseph says, "I may not be in God's land, but God's law is still in my heart. Amen. I can't do it." And Joseph left, and she got his coat. But she never tarnished his character. That's right. She never touched his character. And he said, you know what? I'm not going to do it. Because he had his eyes on the Lord. I tell you, we need that kind of refusal. Amen. I'm not going to do it. Young people, we need that. Right. There's a lot of things in this world trying to get our heart and affection and desires. We need to say, I'm not going to do it. Amen. I'm just not going to yield to it. I'm not going to listen to that. I'm not going to look at that. I'm not going to go over there. I'm not going to participate in that activity. No. Just, hey, listen. Just learn to say no. Right. It can be hard. It can be, it can be in the minority. But I tell you, just learn. You never, you'll never go wrong saying no to sin. That's right. And I promise you this, you'll never regret saying no to sin. True. You'll never regret saying no to sin. Oh, Joseph, for two or two plus, or even more than two years, he may have felt like he regretted it, but he knew he'd do the right thing. 
He never lost sight of the Lord in the days of temptation. I got to hurry. He never lost sight of the Lord, lastly, in the days of his triumph. Pharaoh said, uh, this is my dream. Can you give me the interpretation? He said, oh, well, I can't, but God can. Amen. And here Joseph's brother has come. And they said, hey, please forgive us. We trespassed against us, against the servants, uh, against thee. And, and in verse number 18, they fell down before his face. And what they say, behold, we be thy servants. That's about the last thing we read about Joseph. What was the first thing we read about Joseph? Was him having a dream about them falling down and being his servant. Right. You know what Joseph didn't do? What I would have done probably. When they fell down and said, we be thy servant, I would say, uh-huh. I told you this. Don't you remember I told you this a long time ago? This was going to happen. And all you did was mock me and make fun of me and hated me more and more. Now look at you, you, you look what you look what you've got to. You're right, you are going to be my servants. I am second in command. He didn't do that. He did what we already quoted. He said, God did this. Right. You didn't do this. You didn't ultimately sell me. You didn't ultimately send me to Egypt. God did all this to preserve life. Even when Joseph was elevated, he still said it was God. Amen. He didn't say, I'll tell you what, boys, I'll give you some, some good ideas on how to be a great leader. He didn't say, I'll tell you how to really talk in front of great men. I'll tell you how to achieve greatness. Yeah, I'll tell you how I got where I'm at. No. He said, the Lord did. Amen. The Lord. You know, it's easy. I say it's easy. It's easier to keep our eyes on the Lord when we ain't got much. That's not a good way to say it. You get the gist. It's easier to keep our eyes on the Lord when we have a little. But when we get a little bit in our pocket, somehow or another, things get a little fuzzy. The old memory begins to get a little hazy, doesn't it? Can I just make it applicable in this, this way? into the evangelism mindset when you're lost without God it's not too hard to relate to the old drunk and you're a drunk yourself but when you get saved and you get a Bible in your hand and you come to church and you get you a suit and you got a nice car and you see that fellow over sleeping under a tree it's kind of easy to look down on him you know what the Lord said? I'm preaching a whole different message. Do you know what the Lord said? The Lord told the Israelites over in Deuteronomy, he says, don't be mean to the stranger because you was a stranger in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Can I tell you tonight, there was a time when we all were in Egypt, right. spiritually speaking. Mm -hmm. And this old lost world, we were right in line with them. And God, by his grace, reached down and picked us up yeah, and right. saved us. But if it wasn't for him, we'd still be back there. And that's what Joseph said. Boys, I'm here not because of me and not because of you. I'm here because of God. Am I in the place of God? I don't know what in your life is upside down or inside <laughs> out, but can I tell you tonight, God's still on the throne. Yeah. And God still does all things well. And we can have our faith and trust in the Lord. For 13 plus years, Joseph couldn't see what God was doing. Joseph didn't know how God was orchestrating it. But he just stayed faithful. Amen. And kept his eyes on the Lord. Amen. He never failed to be faithful. Can I tell you tonight, just be faithful. Amen. Just be faithful. And when it's all said and done, we too, like Joseph, will be able to look, maybe it'll be in heaven, but we'll be able to look down and say, He doeth all things well. Amen. Right now, we look at life through just a little peephole. But there's a big canvas we can't see. And we're just a little part of that canvas. I mean, you look at these pictures on the wall. 
We're just one little speck of the brown on the eagle's wing. We're just one little speck of blue on the ocean. There's a whole big picture. God is just using us to paint it all. Sometimes, some people have to be painted in the black cloud. Some people's life is in the sunshine. But I tell you, it's all God's picture. Amen. Just be glad tonight that we're in the picture. Amen. Will you bow your heads with me? you're lost here without the Lord, can I encourage you to come? If you don't know for sure your sins are forgiven, that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, can I encourage you to come? Maybe tonight you feel like kind of like Joseph. Maybe you're not sitting on the throne like Joseph now. You feel like you're down in the pit. Maybe you feel like you've been forgotten in the prison. Maybe you feel like you've been forsaken by the brethren. And I encourage you just to stay faithful to the Lord. Maybe you need to come and pray. Father, we pray in Jesus' name you help those who need help. Whatever that need might be, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with us tonight as you play? You need to come. Questions. Thank the Lord you didn't let us just stay there. You gave us the answers that God has given us. We love you. Thank you, people. I thank the Lord for your faithfulness day after day, night after night. I appreciate it. But now, Let's go do something. Keep some tracks on the way out. Go tell someone about Jesus. There's a lot of people discouraged out there. Mm -hmm. That because of your discouragement, God took care of you. You can be a help to them. Let's go. Hey, Kendra.
I said I'd get a call on that. Pardon? No, I don't even help me much. <laughs> 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 well, if you will, I'll have to do this another time. You may be seated. Tonight, uh, I want you to let Brother Kenzie know that uh, you appreciate him, that you will be praying for him, his family, and uh, also you that knew the uh, Jim, uh, yes, Sue, uh, can you thank your name? Yeah. Uh, uh, you that knew them, or even for sending the card, just put the Bible Baptist Church on their mail and let them know you're praying for them. And keep all of these in prayer. If you will, remember Pat and Sir, uh, Sir Jean, uh, just each one of these, if you will. And, uh, uh, we, are, we love you. God bless you. When Brother Ken is done the same, I want Brother Larry to uh, dismiss us in prayer, if you will. Right. 